Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, it's really an honor to be here uh, in front of you and this big crowd and uh, all the esteemed faculty here. So I'm really excited. Uh, I'll, I'm a physiotherapist from Denmark and currently work in Qatar uh, as a physio and, uh, and a clinical research scientist. So I get to do research and I get to see patients at the same time. So continuously developing and testing and trying to get better at uh, improving the treatment of groin injuries in general. Still haven't found the perfect solution uh, for everyone, but uh, we're getting better and better, I think. And I'll go through some of the evidence that, that's there already and some of the experience that we have with the acute injuries in Qatar. So first, when we look at the overall evidence, so just since 2009, we have six uh, systematic reviews um, spanning from two to 72 two articles, but we, we've, we did one ourselves um, with 72 studies, and we found that only four of these studies could actually be, cons be considered high quality. And if you look at one of the reviews, you'll find that these uh, quality stu high quality studies will go through. So if you read one, you probably don't need to read the rest. But in these four high quality studies, three of them were, were on uh, rehabilitation. And these three all used the, uh, the protocol that we heard about earlier, um, the 99 protocol, the, the HOMIC protocol, uh, as it's also known, where we have these two weeks of, of, uh, um, of specific training for the adductors and abdominals, and then you go on to a more extensive program from week three and onwards. So in these three studies, we had the original study where we had good return to sport race rates, and it's a supervised program, um, and the players got back a bit over, over the four months, as Pierre mentioned earlier. Then in 2011, it was performed in Holland uh, and as an unsupervised home exercise program. Unfortunately, they had a much lower success rate. Uh, so we got to keep, uh, keep uh, the patients in line and, and make sure that they do their exercises. And these were both on the doctor-related groin pain. So if we move over to the inguinal-related groin pain, they modified it a little bit um, and compared it to a, to a surgical intervention. But on the, on the rehab side, they had pretty poor results. Only 50% uh, only of the players actually were back to their sport within a year. So this is kind of the majority of, of the rehab studies that are out there. In one of these studies, they compared it to a multimodal um, treatment, just the, the old school way with some heat, manual therapy, some stretches and then they gradually increased their running. And what we can see from this study is that they also had a pretty poor return to sport uh, rate. So only 50% of the, the players were back, and they were back in about 13 weeks. So a little bit faster than the guys that, that did the other program, but a little bit lower number of, of players. And this is, this is basically it. This is what it, there is of, of high quality evidence uh, in RCT. So, so we're, we're really far behind as, uh, uh, it, it within uh, rehabilitation and, and exercises for, um, uh, for groin pain in athletes. And we can see in a systematic review from 2013 here that the total number of players, even when we're looking at case studies and summing those up, uh, is really, really low. And it's only for the adductor-related groin pain that we have a bit more patients, but still, Within that, only 157, and you sh as you can see. And since 2013, there's still no new RCTs on treatment. Um, so we have to look at some of the, the prospective studies that have come out. Uh, so I'll, I'll go through those. We have a, a modified home link protocol, um, where a small group uh, in, in Iran, it actually is, uh, did the same program. And they thought, OK, we'll, we'll add a little bit to it. Uh, we'll do some stretches, a little bit of core exercises. We'll add the Copenhagen adduction and, and, and get a, a more structured running program in uh, after six weeks. Small number, only 15 players, but we can see that the return to sport rate was also fairly good, uh, 87%, 87%, but they did it in, in, in about six weeks faster. So they do, did have a little bit uh, improved uh, time um, to return to sport, uh, but they only had half the number of patients as, uh, as in the RCT. The same group also did the original version of the protocol and had the exact same uh, number of returns to sport, um, but also a little bit faster than previous. So as Pierre said, it still works, uh, the program, but there's uh, possibly a potential for improvements. 
So just uh, recently, a new uh, study came out l and with a program where they were focusing on intersegmental control, as they call it. So they based their, their focus areas on theoretical assumption of what these players, how these players are, are loading uh, their groin and which movement patterns may be changed in order to reduce the symptoms and then based an exercise program uh, on that. And there are different elements all the way up from the trunk movement during change of directions. Do you have a big trunk lean when you're, when you're changing or even when you're running normally? How's your rotation, pelvic rotation, tilt, hip rotation and so on during these movements? And then trying to intervene towards that uh, with, a, with an exercise program, um, which was then based on different streams with different progression levels. And, and here's a, an example of, of some different focuses have some focus on the hip flexors, uh, as Per also talked about, lateral hip control, abdominal work, and a lit little bit of heavier weight with some squats and deadlifts and so on, and some plyometric work in, in different progression levels. So a little bit higher loading than, than what was done previously, and it's done four times a week for three to four sets per, per person. But what's really important, in my opinion, is also the progressive uh, increase in running um, and progressive increase in multi-directional running, so change the direction drills. And they, they started that first with the linear running and then introduced um, a multi-directional uh, running protocol as well. And this program focused both on technique, um, so trying to, to change certain elements of how we move. These are in standardized tasks, so, so it's of course uncertain whether this will transfer over to reactive situations in sport. Um, but some of the theory behind it, I think, really, really makes sense. So looking both at technique and increasing, just increasing the intensity, so the amount of work at a relatively early stage for both the, both the linear running and, and the change of direction. And when they looked at the players that, that, uh, that completed the protocol and, and came back um, at discharge, you could see that they actually were able to change some of these uh, parameters. Not all of them, but, but some that, that may be relevant for the groin pain. But due to the study, si study design, we, we don't know whether it's just they're moving differently because they don't have any pain anymore. So I think there's a good chance that, that, that these elements are actually affected and, and that we get a good benefit from, from a little bit more focus on, on these elements. And what we see from, from their results, if we're looking at the return to sport rates, uh, uh, this large group had a uh, 73% pain-free return to sport. So here pain gets uh, clearly involved that these are, these are pain-free. And if we look at everyone that returned to sport, there's a 3% that, that returned with symptoms uh, and, and a lot of them which were unknown that they lost because they didn't see them uh, every day. But again, now a, a little bit faster there. On, on average, it was only 10 weeks. So we're getting better. We're reducing the time uh, to return to play. And uh, what they had here talked a little bit about the, the diagnosis. This group blocked all the diagnosis together um, and, and basically gave them the same approach. Uh, and they didn't see a difference uh, in the diagnosis. In my experience, I, I think there will be. Uh, but it probably also depending on um, how you diagnose these elements. And, 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 and I'm with Pierre on, on the pubic aponeurosis. I'm not sure that that is a, an accurate diagnosis, especially not that large of the population. Um, but what they saw was that it didn't really matter with the duration of symptoms before that. As long as you start the program, um, you're expected to have a, a certain timeline following that. They also did a follow-up uh, at discharge with the, with the hip and groin outcome score. And what we can see is that even though they said they were completely pain-free at return to sport, there's a lot of the pl these players who are reporting pain, reporting symptoms, um, even in, in, in daily activity and, 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 and also have a reduced participation at discharge. So these are not perfect players when they get back. So if we're looking at that, then the 10 weeks may, may be a little bit too early and they, they need a little bit more time to, to get back fully. Then there's a new study out here recently that I just have to, to comment on uh, where they, uh, they looked at players um, and basically only saw them for one session and they did a manual stretch, which you can see online, just three, three times 10 seconds, and then told the players to, to, uh, to do an adductor stretch uh, every day, and then told them, yeah, you can go back when you feel like it, and just start at your own level. So that's a, that's a really, <laughs> really easy way. 
uh, of doing it. Um, I see it a little bit as, um, as a, uh, a guy that's on the slope falling down. We tell him, here's a coffee, and uh, you can decide when you want to take the lift up and go again. You can start on the small hill, or you can go all the way to the top, um, and then uh, hope that, uh, that everything will be all right. Uh, and I'm not sure whether or not it's, uh, it's the coffee that actually worked, or it's just the decision of the player. And if we look a little bit closer, what they're actually doing, so they had an 82% uh, return to sport, and they did it already within the first week. So the players basically just waited a little bit, and then they went back. But that sounds like a pretty good return to sport rate, but if we look at the type of players that they have included in the study, 65 of them were already playing. So maybe now we're more over on the management side and saying, okay, you're a bit sore, you have a bit of pain, we'll loosen you up, we'll give you a little bit of rest, and then you can start at the, at the level you, you feel like and then that will improve a bit on, on the return to sports rate. It's a very different patients than the patients that I see to, uh, every day. They have all stopped playing and, and usually stopped playing for, for quite some time. But they did actually do a, a, a decent follow-up here. What you can see is, is the hip and groin outcome score and the different subscales from that uh, over a period of, of uh, 12 weeks, so three months after. And if, if we just look at the blue line, we can see that after two weeks, there's still the mean is still down on 60 and the blue is participation. It's basically just two questions. Uh, have you uh, reduced your duration? Do you feel like your duration is reduced, the liquor scale or that the performance is reduced? And they, they after even though they went back to sport, they're very much reduced in, in both of these, still reduced after six weeks, but when they get to 12 weeks, say, they, they look okay. But if we look at only on the first week, the uh, first two weeks, they actually have quite a, quite a significant, uh, considerable reduction uh, in pain, just measured on a an, on 0 to 10 scale. And we can see that that continues on. But really, I'm not sure whether we can just close our eyes completely or we're going to try to say, okay, you need to do an RCT on that. Uh, and, and then we'll figure out where is this, this improvement coming from. Is it, is it this, the decisions of the player? Is, it, um, is, it, is there anything in the manual treatment that may reduce the symptoms? I, I see a lot of these players, with, especially the ones with the doctor-related groin pain, that, that have a lot of tightness. We go in, do a little bit of manual work, and they can, they can do their session uh, a lot better. But uh, I, would, I would never send them back to, to sport um, just because of a, a small reduce, reduction in pain. Anyway, so here's kind of the focus of, of how we work down in, in Aspitar. We kind of have three focus areas. Uh, first, what we do is we want to isolate the painful structures. So if you have a doctor-related groin pain, we want to go in with a specific uh, adductor exercise, wherever the pain is, if it's related to a muscular tendon unit. We know that uh, we're likely to have a, a mechanotherapeutical effect and a pain reduction as well. So that's our key step. We take out everything all stability and so on, and then focus on, on that uh, structure uh, in isolation. On top of that, we focus on the synergist, so everything that we can make stronger to reduce the load indirectly on this painful structure in the movements. And we take the painful movements as a, as a starting point, saying, okay, where is this player reporting pain? Is it reporting pain and kicking? Is it skating? Where is it? And how are they moving in that position? And how is that position putting stress on this painful structure? And how can we make that movement stronger to reduce the load on that painful structure, which appears to be reacting to that load? And then we want to progress the actual functions. So what, what, what the, the player is doing, if you have a, a regular team sports player, which is the most of the players that we see, they will go up and running, uh, usually at a very early stage. So as, as soon as we can, we'll get them moving within uh, certain, um, um, yeah, within the capacity that they're able to. And then where the main individu individualization goes is, is towards the performance goals, which may be a lot different from different uh, levels of, of sport. You got elite players, you got a sub elite, amateur, and so on, and between the different sports. And that's where the majority of our, of our individualization uh, actually happens. If we go over to how we do this in, in the acute groin injuries, this is, this is kind of a, a, a simple overview of our acute adductor protocol. We have three components. We use a, a number of basic groin exercises 
that we progress in four different phases um, with, with set criteria uh, as to when they, they progress, and I'll get uh, briefly into that uh, later. Then we have a recovery day, and with a recovery day, it's a recovery day from that muscle group. So the groin muscles get a recovery day, which means that we will work hard on something else. Usually what we say is we have an anterior, anterior chain muscle group uh, focus on one day, posterior chain muscle uh, group focus on the other day. So we're giving, uh, we're giving the muscle uh, time to recover and build up and get stronger. And then uh, we have this running and, and sports function progression. Uh, so usually as soon as they can do a few running movements, we get them on to do some slow running and, and some side steps within uh, controlled intensity and controlled range of motion. We then progress that with both uh, linear and, and change the direction running before we get up to a stage where they can do 80% pain-free, then we allow them to, to go on to full sprints and, and change their direction. And we do this with and without ball. Um, when they've completed all these criteria, they then go on to the pitch or on court, depending on the sport, um, and, uh, and, and have some sessions to make sure that they can do the, 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 the sports functions pain-free as well. And not until then, we, we give them back um, to their sport. So if we just focus on the basic groin exercises, our program based initially just on three simple exercises. Here we use it with elastics because that, you know, everybody can use that. We use some really heavy elastics where we can adjust the load a, a lot. I like to use the cables now more. Uh, we just didn't have the, the, the equipment when we started. And these are easily adjusted for progression. So even in the initial stage, you know, you have them in the first session, you can get out. The criteria we, we, we use to start loading is basically just can you walk? Do you have only minimal pain during walking? And can you take your leg out to the side? So for these adductor injuries, as long as they can take out the leg out to the side, we start with, uh, with some resistance in an induction movement. Uh, and that can be five kilos to begin with, or it can be 20 kilos. It all depends on the player and how much he's able to and the pain. Um, we focus on hip flexion and trunk rotation as key elements. Later on, we'll get in the Copenhagen adduction and, and some other exercises as well that, that I won't go too much into now. But what I'll, I'll just touch on is, is the loading. How, how do we load it? How do we determine how many sets, how many reps, and, and how much kilos is, is getting on? And we use something that we call the pain control repetition maximum which is basically um, just a repetition maximum which is adjusted to a, a patient setting because if we work normally with a repetition maximum, you will have the load as, as, as kind of the maximum thing that will uh, limit, you, limit your uh, number of repetitions, whereas uh, in a rehab setting, it will often be uh, pain that will limit the amount of load that you put on uh, in any exercises. For these acute injuries, we use two out of 10 pain as the max. Um, and it may be different in, in, in different other injuries or if you know your player that you can push them a little bit more or you have to hold back a little bit. We use 2 out of 10 as a standard, which meant that whenever patients started the exercise, we will tell them to load up. So if they were pain-free, they would just continue to load. If they feel a little bit of discomfort, 1 out of 10 will continue to load. So put their kilos up uh, until they feel 2 out of 10 pain, and this is where we go. And then we tell them to do as many repetitions as possible. So we're getting out to uh, a somewhat of a, a repetition maximum, which is, which is then limited a bit by, um, uh, by pain. And that may be 15 repetitions or it may be 40 repetitions. But what we know from, from some of the research that's coming out now is that if we do these um, exercises to volitional failure, we may have the same stimula stimulation of protein synthesis rates. Um, and it can feel as hard for the patients at, as it can with a higher load and, and, and a higher intensity. So increase the load 2 out of 10 and do as many repetitions as you can. Then we build up uh, in, in load um, and number of sets, so both load and volume. Um, initially, they'll just do two sets. And, and if they can then, if then they get tired at 20 uh, repetitions, we'll start going the, moving them into to phase three. They'll do a few. Uh, they'll do one more set and work at a bit higher kilos. When they get tired of 15 repetitions, we'll start. Uh, we'll add another set. So, so we'll do now do four sets of, of these uh, exercises that are included in the protocol, 
and we're changing then the the velocity of the movement. So initially we're working with a with a contraction where you have three seconds concentric phase and three seconds eccentric phase. When we get to the last phase, we're doing a, a concentric contraction as fast as you can, and then a controlled eccentric contraction. So I'm not saying this is a, the, the right way to do it. This is a way that that we've uh, we've kind of used in this, and and it seems to be working really well for for these injuries. And and what an, an important point in this is that when we have this one, we say, okay, oh no, it's an acute injury. You, you got to be careful about how much load we put on. They may react. During my time, during my six years there, I haven't had any uh, players who have reacted during an exercise with acute increase in pain or increase, increases in pain the following day due to this loan. Only the only kind of um, symptom we've had is that if the pain increases during the exercise, we reduce the load. So the same principle uh, applies. You get three out of 10, we, we reduce the load a little bit and do another set at, at a lower intensity. Um, and, uh, and then just go, go on from there. Andrea mentioned that we did uh, a study on, on injury mechanisms, and this was speci specifically for uh, adductor longus injuries, which we know ni nine out of 10 of the acute adductor injuries will involve the adductor longus. Um, and we, we could group these, these injuries into two kind of uh, movement patterns. One is the open kinetic change, where we have a high change of direction, mainly in kicking, with a hip extension uh, to flexion, abduction to adduction, uh, and often with a bit of external rotation. So when we think about the adductor longus, it's not only the abduction that we're looking at, it's the, the extension and external rotation really matters as well. And it's a similar similar movement in uh, in the closed kinetic chain, so the, the reaching, for th reaching for the ball or change of direction task where it's more of a push. So we can consider it more of a, of a pulling motion and a pushing motion. And this is why we, we also choose to work on the anterior chain on one day, posterior chain on the other day. So we, we can assist um, uh, in improving function and strength during these uh, specific tasks. And this may change which, uh, in, in regards to which sport that, you, that your player is from. But what we can see in these sports where we have uh, a problem with acute adductor injuries is that it is often this uh, external rotation, hip extension primarily, and, and abduction that, that is, a, is a cause of pain, both in the acute setting and in, in the long-standing setting. And then we get over to the actual functions. We start with the basics and progress. This may be adjusted to the player in the sport. Um, but an important point uh, in this, and we can use different kinds of change of direction tests. These are the, some of the ones that, that we prefer. We do a lot of, of linear 30 meter running as well, accelerations and decelerations, some, some change of direction. But even from the first session, if they, can, if they can just do some running movements, we'll put them on the ladder. So on a, a regular agility ladder, we just have one taped on, on the, in the gym floor. And as long as you stay into, uh, in, in, in relatively small ranges, you're in flexion, you're in small, uh, small levels of, of abduction, you can get a really hard uh, anaerobic exercise in for patients who are actually in, in, in generally in, in considerable pain, but they will not feel pain in that. And it's a great way of measuring your progression because you can measure speed, relative intensity, you can measure uh, the, the um, distance um, between um, the legs. So if you do one box, okay, next time you do a little bit bigger steps or you do another drill, do you feel pain in that? And that really is something that the players appreciate because now your measurements are not only on the, on, on the examination beds, but they can see that I'm getting closer and closer to something that I'll need to do when I'm back on the pitch and, and, and participating in training. And then I'll just briefly touch on, on um, the prognosis of these acute uh, adductor injuries that, that, that we've seen here. We just started the analysis of that, so, so these results are, are a bit preliminary. Um, but one of the main things that, that we have to consider when we're, when we're measuring return to sport is what is our return to sport? What, what is our, our, our kind of our end point in that we say now we, we consider you return to sport? Because I, as we saw in the other study, I can just tell the player, now you can play. You may have a lot of pain, but I'll get my result. So we have some really strict criteria for, the, for the, this 
treatment protocol, they have to be completely pain-free. So completely pain-free on palpation, completely pain-free on, on stretching, resistance. The 10 reps of the Copenhagen adduction, adduction exercise has to be pain-free, T-test. Then they get over to the on-field stuff. They have to do uh, a little bit harder uh, agility test. Spider test is basically just a change of direction test in, in, in multiple angles to both sides. And then, depending on the sport, we will do specific number of, um, of actions that all have to be pain-free. And then that will be our, our what we consider uh, as completion and our return to sport. So that's, that's on the safe side of, of return to sport. Uh, often uh, people will feel that they may be ready uh, a bit before and, and you'll see how that affected us as well here. So we included 81 athletes with an acute uh, adductor injury. And what we can see that that a few of them dropped off uh, during during the time for a number of different reasons, which were um, either they they already wanted to go back to the club and playing even though they had pain, or they were out of job contact, they went on vacation. There there are many issues down down in Qatar that can <laughs> that can influence your your studies. But 61 became uh, uh, pain free. Only 50 of these uh, players uh, completed the sport-specific um, uh, training. And we can see 25 actually returned to sports uh, and they returned to full team training. So we, we gave them a call, all of these guys. Um, if we're looking at the ones that completed the sport-specific training, we asked them a ton of, of questions, patient history, which of these elements are uh, related to um, uh, potentially to the duration of return to sport. Um, then we analyzed that and we saw that a number of these dropped out. Then we looked at these, say, okay, which of these are related to each other? A few more dropped out. And then we can put these into our analysis model together with the other elements of the examination. Clinical examination, also an extensive clinical examination, mainly based on uh, uh, pain provocation test, but also on, on strength and range of motion uh, elements. We saw that uh, individually a lot of these tests will, will tell it, will give us a bit of information uh, on the duration, on the severity, uh, but a lot of these are associated, so we, we get less information that we can then combine with the other information that we get from, uh, from our examination. All of these players had an, an MRI as well. They, they all came in within a week and, and we were able to, to get an MRI of their injury, of their adductor injury, and we did a lot of measures on that. And again, uh, not all of these appear to be relevant in, in our group. Um, and some of these were again associated with the other. So we have a few elements left, uh, just general injury grading from, from zero to three and, and a few of the specific measures in, in millimeters. But when we just look at uh, the patient history and the clinical exam, so what we found when, when we get the pa patient in, we don't necessarily have access to imaging, so what can we get out? Um, just looking at the importance of the different elements, these, these different um, parts of the examinations were what we found to be uh, significantly associated with, um, uh, with the time to return to sport. And we can see that that's a bit on, on self-reported symptoms um, through the hip and groin outcome score. If they had a negative squeeze test, they'll be a little bit uh, quicker. Uh, same if, if they had a higher compliance, they'll be a little bit quicker. But the, the main factor in this is if they had palpation pain at the adductor longus insertion. So that's what, what really is, is one of the key elements in that. When we added the MRI, a few of the elements fell out. Uh, but again, an insertional injury um, was what appeared to be the, the majority. And, and I have to say we included a lot of, um, of, of avulsion injuries as well um, because these are, although they're rare, we, we, we see a lot of these. So they, they, oh, I think we had a, a fourth of our injuries were, were avulsion injuries or were injuries at the insertion. But if you're in the clinic, uh, what, what can we then um, look at? Um, 
Uh, so I'll just go back to this one quick. We see that when we have the MRI, this is kind of what matters the most in, 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 in our model, and a few of the elements fall out. So what we can say from our clinical exam examination is that the most important thing that we can figure out when you get in an, an acute injury, whether or not it's an, it's an avulsion injury or not, but, but if they have palpation pain at the adductor longus insertion, they will take significantly longer time uh, to return to play. So the ones that will have palpation pain were were usually uh, more than, than one month, whereas the, um, whereas the other group that didn't have pa pain at the insertion were more like a, a normal muscle injuries and, and, and on average completed the, the, uh, the, the full protocol in less than three weeks. If we then look at only the guys with, uh, with pain further down in the muscle, we can see it gets much more complex um, if the patient heard a pop, um, limited f flexibility, self-reported symptoms. So there's a lot of elements um, that uh, that now appears to have an association with the time that, that uh, they take to come back. But what we can see that it only explains 50% of the variance. So even though you do this extensive examination, you're not going to be able to predict for that individual how uh, long specifically you're going to get back to sport. And even if you add the MRI, we get a little bit better uh, at that, but still a complex uh, model with a lot of elements that may not apply because any of these measures that we have are unfortunately not linear, uh, which means that we cannot just say if you have 10% um, more strength at the initial examination, you're, you're, you will take one day shorter or something like that. But if we just uh, summarize everything related to, to, to the re rehabilitation and what we do, um, what we know from the evidence, uh, available literature is what it appears to, to have an improvement in, in return to sport times. Uh, the return to sport rates are, are similar. We still have about 10 to, uh, to, to, to 10 to 20 percent of, of our athletes that are not returning um, to sport and, and these may stop sports and do a low or do a different sport or get a surgery. Uh, so these we, we need to figure out more about that, but in general, two to three months is is now what we will consider a, a general guideline. So if in your clinic you you have something similar to that, you're you're probably doing doing a good job already. If that's considerably longer for your patients, you you should probably reassess uh, your approach. Um, how you should do that? Uh, unfortunately, there's no specific formula to to the exercise selection. Uh, I have a lot of opinions on it, but but there's relatively limit, uh, limited evidence, so I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that another time. Um, but the most important factors for me is that, that you focus on, on the athlete's sport requirements and, and what elements that will cause pain for that athlete and, and try to build up uh, the athlete to be able to handle that. Uh, and then go in with, with some isolated exercises working on increasing the specific capacity of, of that painful structure. Then I want you to consider exercising with pain. We do that for both our acute patients and our, and our long-standing groin patients, and and it gives, uh, I think it gives us faster results in, in terms of increases in strength, uh, and, and at least. And then uh, when we do that, we have to remember the recovery time. So if you work hard on on a specific muscle, you have to try to give that muscle as well some recovery the day after, um, and and then you don't necessarily give the athlete full re recovery, but work on something um, uh, that will not load that structure. In general, a graduated return to running protocol is something that I think you should consider very early in your treatment uh, and get that in uh, for, for all of all of these athletes, uh, all of these athletes and, and, and working on, on cutting and, 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 and all the way through to return to sport along with your with your basic exercise program. And still, we cannot completely rule out some form of manual treatment may have effect for, for some of these uh, adductor related groin pain patients. Just on the prognosis, primary predictor, palpation pain at the assertion, that's what you need to remember. If they have that, they're probably going to take a bit longer. Uh, and otherwise, it will probably be a complex uh, uh, clinical reasoning process with a lot of different elements that may be uh, related. We'll only, we'll only explain 50% of the variance. It's a relatively low amount of time to, uh, to, to return to play. So I'm, I'm not sure, even if we do more research uh, at a higher level, um, that we will get much closer to, to predicting the exact times for, for each individual. 
But thank you very much, and uh, you're always welcome if you have a layover in uh, Doha to stop by and see how we do and, and, uh, and, and how we work uh, in the Groin Pain Center.